This is now the time for the annual Bridget Lindley Memorial Lecture. Awfully Bridget, um, who was no age, died in March 2016. And since then, the Family Justice Council has uh, marked her contribution to family law by having a, an annual uh, lecture uh, on a diverse range of, of, of topics. Apart from the first one, which I gave, which was more of a pipe opener, the others have all been very good. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure today's will be the, the same. Uh, Bridget was uh, a stunning person. She uh, was a person of great force, had strong opinions uh, about family law. She desperately cared about family law. She could have been a successful solicitor in any field of endeavour and made shed loads of money, but she chose to work for the charity, the Family Rights Group, as their uh, lawyer, and it's to our infinite benefit that she, uh, she did. Um, she was dedicated. She was humane, she had enormous insight into these difficult problems, and she was jolly feisty. Uh, and uh, that combination, mixed with great charm, um, was uh, really a winning um, formula, uh, and we all, we all miss her. Um, of course, these things are planned um, with great care in the President's office, uh, and we've deliberately chosen International Women's Day for the Bridget Lindley Memorial <laughs> Lecture. Um, we haven't, it's a coincidence, but it's a fitting coincidence because Bridget would have been very, very pleased and there would be a smile that um, we're doing it on, on, on this day. I think Bridget would also be very pleased that the Family Rights Group has gone from strength to strength uh, under the leadership of Cathy Ashley. Uh, and um, what's been nice, actually, is that there was a, an event about six months ago when the Family Rights Group moved to new premises uh, and awfully four women have died uh, in their prime uh, uh, connected with the Family Rights Group over the years and there are four rooms named after each of these uh, individuals uh, and the family members of each of the four families came along and I met Bridget's family again and um, her daughter said what's really good about these occasions where mum is uh, remembered is that when it all happened and she died I was much younger and it all people said lots of nice things but they went over my head but um, to hear people talk about her now and to see this contribution being carried on by others uh, is um, you know a very very strong message that this was a valuable person my mum uh, in, in your your lives um, singling people out I, I think Bridget would be very chuffed that Angela Fraser Wicks a, a parent who's been through the family justice system is now the chair of the family rights group. That feels entirely right. And Bridget would have said not before time that we had someone <laughs> like that. Still enough, um, Dr. Sheena Webb is a clinical psychologist and she's going to give this year's lecture. The theme of the whole day is trauma in the family justice uh, system. Of course, what we're dealing with in terms of the substance of the cases uh, is traumatic uh, often. Um, but there's other areas of trauma. What we do is traumatic uh, in terms of the process and its impact on people. And I don't think we think about the trauma involved in family justice much at all. Well, not today. We're going to concentrate on it today. Uh, and um, Dr. Sheena Webb, who's previously been very involved in FDAC and is now an independent consultant with a focus on complex trauma and developing uh, trauma-informed services is going to give her lecture which is entitled Hidden in Plain Sight, Trauma and the Family Court. Um, Gina will speak for most of the, the time allotted but we hope there'll be time for questions and answers at, at the end. So enough from me, over to uh, Dr. Sheena Webb and this year's Brid Bridget Lindley Memorial Lecture. Sheena. Thank you. very much. I put my watch here to, to keep me on time, but I, I don't understand how it works, so it might bleed. So if it does do that, I'm very sorry <laughs> about that. Um, good morning. Um, I wanted to start by thanking the Family Justice Council for inviting me to speak today. I didn't have the pleasure of knowing Bridget Lindley myself, but having read about her life and her work and about her willingness to challenge the status quo and the very tangible changes that she brought about, I'm very grateful to be speaking in her honour. And one of the things I read about Bridget was that she had an interest in bringing psychological theory into her work and her understanding of attachment. I understand it informed her contribution to frameworks to allow children to sustain, sustain contact with their birth families. <clears throat> 
And I believe there is so much to be gained from bringing our disciplines together in this way. Um, as whilst the Family Court is a legal establishment, the issues um, it deals with are fundamentally intertwined with the psychology of everyone involved. So today I will also draw on psychological theory to explore a paradox around trauma. I'll argue that within Family Court, trauma is both seen and unseen, that we are fundamentally orientated towards trying to address it, but somehow unable to. But if we can use psychological theory to understand the role that trauma plays, we can break through this impasse. Before I start, I want to acknowledge that trauma is something that touches us all. And as I speak today, I do so knowing that some of you may carry trauma of your own. And whilst I'll be talking from a rather clinical point of view, it isn't without an appreciation of the deeply personal and painful nature of some of the experiences that we carry. I will try and tread carefully, but I do believe we can't helpfully respond to trauma if we shy away from the reality of what it is and what it does. So I left clinical psychology training about 20 years ago, armed with what I thought was a good grounding of the conditions of the human mind, and I'd learnt about diagnoses and assessment methods and evidence-based therapies. Um, but my training had really prepared me to treat a theoretical population. It hadn't really prepared me for working with the reality um, of the complexities of the ch child and family situations that I encountered, initially working in youth offending. And as I kind of muddled my way through, trying to engage a sort of stream of very angry and distressed and reluctant young people, there was one common and repeating theme their experience of trauma, and not the kind of single event car crash type trauma that I'd studied, but the insidious, pervasive and repeated exposure to human harm. And although it was clear to me and everyone else that I worked with that this must be at the heart of their struggles, it didn't make me any more effective. So I moved into family court work, I think with the naive belief that I might be more effective if I kind of went upstream of the developmental pathway. I felt that if I could work with parents, maybe I could stop things from ever getting to this point. But once I started working with parents in care proceedings, I quickly realised there was no upstream. There were just different points on the same cycle. No matter where I seemed to be, I ran into the same issue, people's experience of trauma. Now, over the years, I've been lucky enough to work in teams that have given me the freedom to step outside of traditional models of psychological assessment and treatment, and that have allowed me to sit alongside and think together with professionals from non-mental health disciplines. That has allowed me to try new things, to collaborate, to problem solve, to really look under the bonnet of trauma and see what we can achieve if we put it at the center of our thinking. And the perspective I share today comes from those experiences. So the first point I want to make, which is a blindingly obvious one, of course, is that I really don't think I need to persuade you of the prevalence of trauma in um, the family court uh, or within care proceedings, for example. The current trauma of the children and the historical trauma of parents is described in report after uh, report. Um, and um, there, is a limit, uh, there, there is limited data on this, but I know, for example, the research with mothers who had experienced recurrent care proceedings, which I know Claire will talk about later today, found that 53.1% reported childhood sexual abuse. 55.9% reported four or more adverse childhood experiences. But trauma has relevance to private law also. A literature review by Adrian Barnett in 2020 found prevalence rates of domestic abuse within private proceedings between 49 and 62 percent. And Helen Adams last year pointed out the significant mental health, act, uh, mental health impact of these proceedings on parents and children. In fact, the very nature of family court is such that on the whole, people are coming to court because of something that has gone wrong. They enter proceedings perhaps in the wake of a separation, a family catastrophe, or at the culmination of years of abuse. And so court is often the last stop in an already very difficult journey. So trauma is visible to us in family court before, during, and after proceedings. But yet despite this, I believe we are still struggling to respond to it. Um, I often hear people acknowledge the sheer scale of trauma affecting a parent or a child, accompanied by a kind of sense of resignation we don't have enough time, we don't have the right resources. And this helplessness we feel, I, I think, pushes trauma to the back burner. We then start to sort of look away from it. Um, it's to be dealt with another time, to be dealt with by another service. 
But why is it that we're not able to respond effectively? How can a parent go through successive proceedings and losing one child after another and receive no meaningful help for something we know is affecting them? Why is it that children who've endured so much adversity are not able to access a mental health service that we can clearly see that they need? Um, the other point that I want to make is that we now understand that our service systems, and not just the family court, have the potential in themselves to traumatise if they're not trauma aware. Um, and of course, um, family proceedings carry an inherent threat to the most visceral and primal of all needs, our connection to our children. And I know you know this, but if we stay with this for a moment, when we do the same job day after day, even one as kind of extreme as this, there are aspects that become normalized. They become part of the fabric and the brain cannot help but habituate. We're still shocked um, and, and punctured by highly distressing or unusual situations. But in order to function professionally, we have to find a way to get on with the job in hand. But for a parent, the threat of losing a child or losing time with their child is in and of itself a potentially traumatizing experience. And on top of this, the nature of court itself brings potentially traumatic experiences. For many survivors, their trauma has already involved an abuse of power. And the inherent power imbalances within the court risk recreating this. The austerity of the environment, the formal language, impersonal processes do nothing to soften the experience. The way in which evidence is gathered, so I didn't realize this slide involved so many clicks, <laughs> but the way in which evidence is gathered means that traumas are revisited, shared amongst parties, sometimes not believed. A report by Rosemary Hunter and colleagues published in 2020 found that mothers involved in private law proceedings um, described them as re-traumatizing, regardless of the outcome, with some describing it as the worst experience of their lives. Giving evidence, cross-examination, being in court with abusers were particularly traumatic, but lack of safety measures in common areas was also highlighted. Now, trauma affects the nuts and bolts of our human functioning. We use the word trauma quite liberally to describe both the exposure to and the psychological consequence of harmful events. And there's a wide spectrum of experiences that we would describe as traumatic. But very crudely, at one end of the spectrum, we have kind of single event traumas, what we call type one traumas. Um, and many of us will be exposed to this type of trauma and a lot of us will recover. But for some, this experience can have a lasting consequence. And there are certain things that increase the risk of enduring difficulty, if it's intentional rather than accidental, the level of social support that we receive afterwards. And these type one traumas are more commonly associated with diagnoses like anxiety or PTSD. But we now understand that the more trauma you're exposed to over a longer period of time, at a younger age, the closer the relationship with the person who hurt you, the more at risk you are of developing a wide range of physical, psychological, and behavioral difficulties. This so-called type two kind of trauma was what we often refer to as chronic or complex, and is related to the impact of being trapped in harmful situations that you can't escape from. Now, what, much of what I'm going to say about trauma applies across this spectrum. Um, but what I want you to hold on to is the further you move towards this type 2 end of the spectrum, the less likely your difficulties will be recognized as related to your trauma. This type of trauma leads to issues that are more likely to be labeled as poor choices, personality problems, or social issues. And this has profound implications for the way service providers respond and, in fact, for the way survivors are made to feel about themselves. Now, trauma is really about threat, threat to our safety, our physical and mental integrity. And as humans, we orient to threat above all else, OK? Because if we're not safe, nothing else matters. So type 1 trauma kind of makes us very reactive to threat, which is why people with PTSD are often on very high alert and very easily triggered by reminders of trauma. But when we're in situations of sustained and chronic harm, we actually adapt to threat. And this has more pervasive impacts on our core human processes, our relationship with our bodies, our emotions, our thinking, our sense of self, 
It means our relationships and our behaviours are organised by threat and a need to protect ourselves. Because we've, and because we've adapted over time, because we've learned to suppress or dissociate from overwhelming feelings that the trauma has triggered, we stop looking traumatised. We start to look perhaps numb, or maybe we start to look angry. Sometimes we just seem fine. Okay, sorry, again, too many clicks. <laughs> Um, and so, um, whilst all trauma has the potential to cause long-term psychological harm, chronic and repeated trauma leads to profound changes in the mind and body that are hidden in plain sight, but which fundamentally affect the way that people function. And to illustrate one aspect of this, all we need to do is notice to what happens to our minds when we're under pressure. Perhaps we're late for an appointment, or we've just been given terrible news, or we have to give a really scary lecture. And the emotional <laughs> overwhelm, the restlessness, the agitation, the zoning out that we experience, okay, these are all real things that we all experience. Now imagine filling out a form reading a report, trying to listen to someone explain something really complicated to you, when we don't feel safe and our emotions are activated, it's really hard to concentrate and to connect and to process what's going on around us. And within court proceedings, um, we're often asking people to do things, um, to engage in something, to complete a list of tasks, to collaborate, um, to think about their behaviour. But um, the problem is that um, we're asking people to function at this kind of higher order, cognitive, problem-solving part of the mind, the top of the pyramid, before we have established the foundations of safety needed for people to feel emotionally regulated to have access to that part of the mind. So, and the very nature of adversarial proceedings places a heavy load on an already overloaded mind. Um, I'm amazed, actually, at those parents who are able to navigate such a complicated process under such extreme stress. But I am aware that some parents go through it in a mental blur, taking very, very little in, kind of going through the motions and leaving with not much understanding of what's happened to them. Uh, traumas, what am I doing for time? Fundamental impact on emotion and cognition affects people's ability to self-regulate and process information. And new situations trigger anxiety, leading to freeze or collapse. Um, and the other thing is that chronic adversity, it kind of erodes our hope. It erodes our confidence. People get conditioned to feel that they can't do it themselves. Um, it teaches people to protect themselves from harm by hiding or being defensive or shutting down or being rigid. And these self-protective mechanisms disrupt functioning. People don't attend meetings. They might drop out of treatment. They might forget to take their medication. Um, and these things not only impede people's progress and impact perhaps on parenting, but they are often perce perceived by professionals as a lack of motivation or a kind of a lack of willingness to engage. Um, and this perception is kind of rooted in an assumption. If we just tell people what they need to do and set out the consequences of not doing it, they will do it. And if they don't do it, it's because they're not motivated enough, um, or they are resistant, or they are unable to prioritize the needs of the child. It is perceived as a won't, whereas I would argue that for some survivors, it is a can't. Um, now, for many survivors of trauma, the harm caused by people, often trusted people, conditions the mind and body to be fearful and reactive to others. And survivors are often evaluating whether people are safe at a very non-conscious nervous system level. And no matter how nice or skilled we are, the starting point may be one of visceral mistrust. And survivors, as I said, learn to protect themselves maybe by avoidance or using anger or placating us. And again, we may misconstrue this as poor engagement. Um, in, a, in the family court, which is already a very threat-saturated uh, situation with many unfamiliar professionals, the relational demands on people could not be higher. And it's no wonder that therefore some parents struggle to engage effectively or may avoid attending court altogether. But there is another dimension to this, us. <laughs> we are people with our own histories, our own pressures, our own blind spots, we also feel nervous. We've also learned ways of protecting ourselves from our anxiety. Um, Sandra Bloom, an American um, psychiatrist, reminds us that frequently we think of service delivery in some sort of abstract way, as if human emotions and human experience play little, if any, role in that delivery of services. Um, when we're not aware of our own inner reactions, we may instinctively defend ourselves, switching from responsive to reactive. <laughs> 
Um, His Honour, Judge Dancy and Dr Kate Helen, um, in their paper, um, point out how the extraordinary pressures of the family justice system bring out defence mechanisms in both parents and professionals. And that, uh, to quote them, professionals blame parents because they are protecting themselves from the human misery to which they are exposed day in, day out. And if we're not mindful of the emotional impact of our work, distress and discomfort can accumulate. And we develop a trauma of our own which keeps us awake, affects our ability to focus, changes our perception of the world, and we may even reach a point where we switch off our own empathy and (coughs) compassion, the very tools we need to engage and relate to the people we're trying to help. Um, For a long time, trauma has been synonymous with the diagnosis of PTSD, the nightmares and the flashbacks. Um, And there's a few problems with this. It's created the sense that trauma really doesn't exist outside of these symptoms. Like if you don't have PTSD, you kind of got away with it. You don't have, uh, your trauma hasn't affected you. Um, But PTSD isn't the only mental health diagnosis associated with trauma. And in fact, it co-occurs with lots of other diagnoses. Um, Plus, people, as we've said, who are exposed to chronic situations of harm develop a much broader array of symptoms, which we now refer to as complex complex trauma or complex PTSD. And these symptoms relate to difficulties with emotion, self-perception and relationships. I'm just trying to work out where I am. Okay. Let's move on. Um, So to date, complex PTSD has been a largely unrecognised condition. And the symptoms have usually been attributed to other diagnoses like personality disorder or they're just not recognised as a mental health need at all. And yet the evidence suggests this is a very common outcome of trauma. In 2019, an epidemiological study in the UK by Thanos Karatsias and colleagues studied 1,000 people who'd been exposed to trauma. And among this group, the prevalence of PTSD was 5.3%. The prevalence of complex PTSD was 12.9%. Complex PTSD was more associated with chronic or childhood trauma. It had a greater impact on functioning. And among those with complex PTSD, 45% had a chronic illness, 58% had an alcohol difficulty, 89% had major depression, and over half experienced suicidality. But clinically, this group of people present a challenge to the way in which mental health services are currently delivered. It's a developmental problem that manifests in adulthood. It's a mental health problem that might be expressed in our relationships. Um, It's a psychological problem that might be expressed in drug use or a physical health problem. In other words, the symptoms may only show themselves in non-mental health services and mental health services may not recognise these symptoms as things that they are supposed to treat. Okay. Um, I love this quote by Rebecca Brooks. She says, trauma is a tricky customer. It can make the impact of historical events appear to be caused by current events. It can hide itself in one place and unleash itself with force in another and drive those living and working with children affected by by it into a new trauma of their own. In my experience, survivors survivors of complex trauma are most likely to receive treatment through statutory involvement due to crime or domestic violence, homelessness or safeguarding, or they present to crisis provisions within the health service. Services which are commissioned to address the visible problems rather than the underlying drivers. And therefore, we end up treating the symptoms without addressing the underlying cause. We end up looking only at the tip of the iceberg. Okay. And... One of the other issues with this, and I'm sorry, I realise I should have got through this, I'm going to stand here for two seconds, is that um, we end up ignoring all of this stuff that we know from research, um, plentiful research on trauma is important in the way that people function, and we just focus on people's symptoms. And we bury those symptoms under a diagnosis. We're looking at people from the outside in. We lose all of this very helpful, important information. Um, If we're not aware of the way in which um, trauma influences a person's behaviour, we run the risk of perceiving survivors' behaviours as moral deficits or intrinsic flaws. Concepts like disguised compliance um, imply a level of intention that doesn't take into account the impact of trauma. Um, And children and parents affected by trauma may engage in behaviours that we perceive as challenging. And when we don't recognise the perceptive function that they serve, we run the risk of viewing them as being a problem rather than having a problem. Um, Another way in which trauma drops out of sight lies in our assumptions about what is or isn't traumatic. So we tend to focus on physical harm and underestimate emotional harm. 
Okay, emotional harm in children often doesn't get the urgent response that physical harm does. But studies indicate that the longer term developmental and mental health impacts are no less severe. In 2020, there was a multi-country study of intimate partner violence by Lucy Potter and colleagues, which found that the impact of psychological abuse within relationships is of a similar magnitude to physical abuse. Our assumptions, whoopsie, um, sorry. Our assumptions about what being traumatized looks like causes us to make mistake people who are numbing or dissociated as unaffected or resilient. And Eamon McCrory and colleagues have demonstrated that children exposed to maltreatment already show brain changes and changes, changes in their psychology, even when they're not showing signs of any psychiatric problems. So for some survivors, our system's failure to see the trauma and recognize its impact can lead to a lifetime of feeling that of feeling the impact without it ever being responded to, and at worst, of being punished by a system that sees their behaviours as challenging and unacceptable. This is a quote from a survivor. The minute I got that diagnosis, which was personality disorder, people stopped treating me as though what I was doing had a reason. All that psychiatric treatment was just as destructive as what had happened before, denying the reality of my experience. That was the most harmful thing. Um, The other point I want to make is that The divisions between services do not exist within people. The process of assessing a family often draws us into identifying a list of issues um, like mental health or domestic abuse or drug use. And from a legal point of view, I can kind of see why that provides a clear framework. And we then look for concrete and measurable indicators like drug tests or police call outs. And it allows us to feel confident about whether we think a risk is being addressed or not. But it ignores the fact that these things don't operate in isolation. And the broader system reinforces this. Our services are kind of carved up in this way. Um, If we have a person with multiple issues, we often send them off to different services. We might have different experts and specialists giving opinion about their circumscribed area. And uh, it is helpful to have specialist expertise, but we lose sight when we do that of the fact that the divisions between these services and disciplines do not exist within us as people. And not only that, but because no one's designated to deal with trauma, it falls into the gap Again, this thing that's kind of to be dealt with in a clinic room by somebody else, rather than recognising that it might be a core issue that is driving all of these other things. A further issue relates to our disconnection, the disconnection between court experts and the system beyond. Um, And often I find these really expensive and extensive assessments maybe the only opportunity a person has had to see a mental health professional. Um, And yet so often this really valuable clinical information doesn't translate to meaningful intervention for parents or children. People will be aware of a recent study by PAUSE that found 82% of mothers said they were not referred to services for support after an expert assessment. Um, I'm willing to bet that everyone here um, has an implicit understanding of trauma. In fact, most people make an intuitive link between how we function now and the stuff that's happened to us in the past. It's in books, it's in films. Um, and in family court, I think we recognise that trauma is in some way contributing to the difficulties that we see. Um, we kind of use that language. We talk about people needing treatment for their trauma. But this intuitive wisdom that we all share is not what has organised the services that we operate in more broadly. We're in the midst of a revolution around trauma research and treatment, and new papers are being published all the time, there's new training all the time, but I don't see a lot of evidence for this, actually, if I'm honest, on the front line. And I still see mental health reports about trauma survivors that don't acknowledge the role of trauma in their symptoms. I still see survivors being turned away from services because they don't meet the criteria. I still hear professionals attribute survivors' behaviour as non-compliance or disguised compliance. And what troubles me is that we are talking about trauma and our understanding of trauma as if it is a newly discovered thing, but it really isn't. Okay, Um, Pierre Janet described uh, symptoms of dissociation and traumatic memories at the turn of the 20th century. That's right. Um, So uh, accounts that we would recognize today, modern psychologists would recognize today. But our society's uncomfortable relationship with trauma has has somehow allowed all of this knowledge of trauma to be sidelined for over 100 years. And because we haven't had this recognition, there's been no basis for commissioning, no basis for service development, no mandate to train the workforce, and limited funding for research. And what that means is that our health and social care services have developed without um, trauma in mind. Okay, so um, people are engaging with a system that really is not 
designed to meet their internal needs. Nobody, they're getting help for everything but their trauma. Um, now, the court often defers to mental health traumas, I think with the assumption that all mental health pro professionals understand trauma. But trauma, as I've described it today, has not, in my experience, been part, core part of medical or psychological training. It wasn't core part of mine. Um, and I think some experts may still not take it into consideration. Even when experts do recognize the need for a trauma-informed approach, we still struggle to access the treatment. Um, and we know getting mental health treatment of any kind is really difficult at the moment because of the pressures in the system. Um, but even specialist services for trauma are very limited in what they will accept in terms of referral and will often not accept childhood trauma or complex trauma. Um, and because, um, but it's not just about a resourcing issue. Mental health services are commissioned on the basis of psychiatric diagnostic frameworks. And as complex PTSD didn't exist until 2019 as a diagnosis, pathways for complex PTSD are few and far between. Treatment isn't just hard to access, it's just not available. I hope I haven't depressed you too much. <laughs> It's a bit of a rant, I'm sorry. Um, it's a well-meaning one. Um, but it's, it's only really by fully recognising all the ways in which trauma interacts with the work of the family court that we'll be able to run, respond helpfully. And I'm sure there are more things that I could have said. Um, but if trauma remains hidden, at best, we're going to miss a valuable opportunity. At worst, we're actually going to cause more harm. So what can we do about it? Well, the first thing I think we can do, and I know that we're going to think a lot about this today, I think in our groups and workshops, which is just brilliant, is we can try and minimise the collateral harm um, of, of proceedings. Um, trauma informs become a bit of a buzzword, and it can be mis mistaken as a bit of a kind of bland effort to be nice to trauma survivors or to screen everyone for trauma. It's neither of those things. Um, it's about recognising the the tra triggering or traumatizing aspects of our service and striving to adapt our environment, to adapt our processes to be more trauma sensitive. Um, and the principles of trauma-informed care, again, they can look a little bit bland. We all think we're doing these things already, but they're really about counteracting the impact of past wounds. Choice and agency are restored to those people who have been overpowered and trapped. Transparency and authenticity is given to those people who felt deceived or betrayed. And feelings of shame and denigration are met with compassion and a genuine desire to build up strength. And I know we have to follow, sorry, due process. I know this is a legal system. We have to provide justice. But can we provide justice if the processes themselves put so much pressure on people that they don't actually have full access to the most functional parts of their mind? Um, Randall and Haskell, two legal academics from the States, argue that effective, fair, intelligent and just legal responses must work from a perspective which is trauma-informed. Felicity Jerry, a King's Counsel from Australia, has argued that trauma is so prevalent within the courts that adopting a trauma-informed may be an integral part of procedural fairness. And within the family court, this means training the workforce in trauma in awareness. It means looking at our environment and our standard processes through the lens of a trauma and looking for opportunities to minimize harm. Um, and it's difficult to describe trauma-informed care because everything from the little things to the very big things. It's every, it could be at one end of the spectrum, it could be changing the way that the waiting areas are set up. At the other end of the spectrum, we could be talking about developing non-adversarial approaches and changing the entire way we do things. And I think Helen Adams spoke very eloquently about that last year. Um, so to be truly trauma-informed, we need an organizational commitment for this, for this culture shift. And I know we're going to hear some, about some really lovely interventions throughout the day today. Um, but the other thing we can do is we can use our human capacities. We can really switch these on. Um, because so much of trauma involves uh, uh, is about relational threat, even small relational missteps can actually um, get in the way of effective working relationships. So we can use these fundamental pillars of safe human connection, empathy, and compassion because these core qualities help people to feel safe, help people to feel regulated within our nervous system. It's not just being nice and sympathetic, it's about really listening, being genuinely curious. Um, everyday interactions between professionals and parents can either reinforce or they can challenge assumptions about whether people can be trusted. And in a way, recovery from trauma can happen in the accumulation of these small moments when people, um, you know, um, trusted people behave like trusted people, a greeting from a security guard, sensitively worded judgments uh, given by a judge. Um, so um, 
One of the problems, of course, is the very nature of the actions that we are taking within court can often seem very much at odds with this. You know, how can we be therapeutic and compassionate when we're taking drastic actions like restricting someone's access to a child? But I think we can. There are still things we can do to make it worse or make it better. And one of the worst things we can do is to deny the pain we're causing. At the very least, we should be acknowledging the pain that we cause. Um, now, this approach requires emotional resilience on the part of professionals, so it's quite difficult to sustain. It's easy to be trauma-informed in theory, but hanging on to that and staying in that place day to day, um, that actually takes quite a lot of work, and professionals need adequate time and support to do it. Um, the other thing we can do is, rather than focusing on people's deficits, we really want to focus on maximising the strengths that people have within them. And when we understand the nuts and bolts about how trauma affects indiv individuals, we can unlock those strengths and start to build resilience. Um, when we understand emotional regulation, we can either support people to feel regulated in court. You know, we can use the way that we are trauma-informed to reduce triggers, to be clear in our communication, to help people at least broadly stay within that window of tolerance that we want them to be in. And we can take a strengths-based approach, um, helping people to build up the resources, the practical resources they need. And it's not about propping people up. It's about breaking things down into manageable steps and giving clear information and reducing unnecessary barriers. Um, uh, what we're trying to do is take all of those nuts and bolts I talked about and really help people to kind of pull those together into an integrated system of strengths, okay? Something that we all really <laughs> strive to be. Um, and above all, we need to listen to the wisdom of survivors um, and trust that survivors themselves know about their experiences the best and can help us um, more than anybody else um, to think about how we can change our services. And we need to work together. Okay, it's not just communicating and coordinating, but genuinely interdisciplinary thinking. Rather than carving people's problems up, we need to bring the expertise together where and when it's needed in a coherent way. I would argue for greater collaboration and transparency between experts and the court and the professional networks around the family um, and that recommendations from experts should lead to realistic pro prospects of treatment beyond the end of proceedings. No one agency or discipline can do this by themselves. Um, we need to stop kind of guarding the boundaries of our own professions and recognise that trauma transcends them all. And we need commissioning that allows us to step outside these tightly held um, budget streams. We need to draw together resources to meet the survivors as they are, not expect survivors to fit into the way the, the services as we have set them up. And we can use the science. Um, I feel within the family court that when it comes to trauma, we are sometimes still relying on old science. Um, there's a lot of new wisdom and understanding around trauma, but it feels like it's taking time to permeate into the system. One of the most common diagnoses in family court, in my experience, is emotionally unstable personality disorder. Um, trauma researchers like Mary Len Clot, I can't pronounce her name, <laughs> have pointed out the large overlap in symptomology between emotionally unstable personality disorder, PTSD, and complex PTSD. There is a cumulating body of research that links EUPD to early childhood trauma, in fact, particularly emotional harm. Now, you could argue this is semantics. It's the same clinical issue with a different name. Okay, many of the treatments for EUPD are probably quite helpful for people with complex trauma. Um, so does it matter? And my view is it absolutely matters. Because when we give a diagnosis that does not explicitly acknowledge the role of trauma in its genesis, and we call it a personality disorder, we are telling people there's something wrong with you. If we want to take a trauma-informed approach, the starting point is recognizing that something happened to you and that you are showing a normal response to an abnormal situation. Currently, I feel the choice of experts is kind of led by broadly matching the discipline of the expert to an identified problem area. But I feel that expertise in trauma and in complex trauma is not, in my experience, a particular requirement, despite how prevalent an issue trauma is. And the other thing is that parents are asked to give their histories in great detail in these assessments to talk about trauma to someone they've never met before. And sometimes it isn't even acknowledged in the final conclusions. And I feel the worst thing that we can do to a trauma survivor is ask us to tell them about their trauma and then do nothing. Um, I know that there's work ongoing to improve access to expertise within the court. 
um, and the expert witness advisory group's recent research has highlighted some really important issues with practice. Um, and I would re argue that we really need experts who can bring the most up-to-date science on complex trauma into the court. Um, because in the absence of robust science, there's a danger that we sort of fall back on what feels right. Um, we tend to rely on kind of implicit assumptions about psychological functioning, and we all have them. We've all got our own little theories. <laughs> um, um, for example, you know, that people who don't have a diagnosable mental health problem don't have a mental health problem, or that children who seem fine are resilient, or that people who attend treatment programs are benefiting from them, or that people who don't change are not motivated enough. These assumptions don't necessarily hold true for trauma survivors or anyone else, really. Um, there's so much data and research out there, but experts need to be abreast in this. They need to have had, I think, training in trauma. I think if people are giving opinions about treatability, they need to have had some experience of treating trauma, if I'm honest. Um, and we need to take survivor needs into consideration in the way expert assessments are carried out. If the process of assessment itself is re-traumatizing, how can we argue that it's an accurate assessment of a person's mental functioning? We need to challenge the status quo. We need to de design interventions and service systems from the blueprints of the people we are trying to help, rather than rigidly holding on to the idiosyncratic and arcane frameworks that involved in another era when trauma was unseen. We need to advocate for trauma to be recognized and appropriately diagnosed, for professionals to include trauma in their thinking and for about formulation and diagnosis. We need to improve both access to and the diversity of treatments available, Nice guidelines tend to focus uh, trauma treatment on CBT and EMDR, which I'm um, not knocking, they are good treatments. But a recent meta-analysis by Coventry and colleagues in 2021 found that whilst these traditional treatments are effective in treating PTSD symptoms in those with complex trauma, they are less effective for treating the broader self-regulation systems. And there's consensus among many trauma specialists that we need sort of bottom-up, body-based um, interventions as well as these top-down interventions, but these are very rarely available. Uh, we need to advocate and lobby wherever we can. I often think we sort of feel a bit resigned to the lack of treatment available, but change will only happen if we keep um, highlighting the gaps in services. And in the meantime, rather than becoming roadblocked by the lack of trauma treatment, we can look for resources that will support parents and children to stabilise and build resilience. Re recovery from chronic and complex trauma is a long-term process. Um, it, it's not just about processing memories, it's also about building up resources, um, those core human resources that might have been taken away. Um, and there's loads of interventions out there that can be helpful. They're not specifically designated necessarily as trauma interventions or in trauma services, but things like mindfulness and ment mentalization, emotional regulation, even yoga can be very, very helpful. At the very least, we can start to talk to parents and children about the impact of trauma and the role it might play um, in their day-to-day -day lives so that they can make their own start on recovery. Um, oh, nearly there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the court, I know, is not a mental health service, okay? But the reality is that trauma affects people wherever they go, okay? And whilst um, there does need to be a broader change in the systems beyond the court, there are things that we can do now that are within the sphere of our control. We can adopt a trauma-informed culture which minimizes as much as possible the emotional consequences of proceedings and that uses the wisdom of survivors to inform change. We can use the ever-growing knowledge base on trauma to really see what its impact is on children and parents and use this understanding to drive our response. We can put in place whatever trauma interventions we can access and lobby anyone that will listen for those that we can't. And we can challenge ourselves and the systems around us to let go of frameworks and practices that just don't work for survivors. Sometimes when I start working with someone who's experienced a lot of trauma, they will tell me they feel like their problems are sort of too big and too insurmountable, like they've struggled for such a long time, they don't really believe that anything could change. And I think we as a system experience a parallel impasse. We see this kind of immense impact of trauma and we feel overwhelmed and we feel like our small contribution won't make a difference. And that feeling of overwhelm and helplessness risks pushing us back into the denial and avoidance that we're trying to get out of. In my experience, change happens bit by bit, through small moments when a person is able to do something new, see a different result. And those moments get more frequent and join together until life starts to feel quite different. And we often think that big things need big solutions, but even a mountain is climbed one step at a time. Each one of us has the ability to influence a part of this. And trauma is there, whether we choose to see it or not, we're responding to it one way or another. And the choice is not whether or not to respond to trauma. The choice lies in how. Thank you very much for listening.
wow. <laughs> that was amazing. That was, uh, I don't think anybody failed to understand not only the big message but the detail, but it felt very new, and it shouldn't because what you're saying um, is, makes entire sense. Um, so thank you so much for, for that, and so passionately delivered as well, and um, so that was, that was great. And I'm very jealous of your slides as well. You, okay. This is a very good <laughs> Although I suspect in later life you'll have arthritis of your right thumb. <laughs> Now, we've got, we've got 10 minutes for questions now. Um, those watching online, uh, Melanie Carew, who I can't see, but I think is somewhere there, has been monitoring uh, Slido, which is collecting up the online questions. And so from time to time, Melanie will pop up and ask a particularly well-informed question. And we'll all think, wow, Melanie's well-informed. Well but in fact, it'll be from people on the, <laughs> online. But in the room, any, any questions? Yes, lady over there. Hang on, there's a, there's a microphone. We need the microphone. Not, not, we need the microphone so the people online can hear. Of course, yeah. yeah. Um, morning, everyone. Uh, Colette Dutton, Director of Children's Services at Wigan Council. Um, <clears throat> delighted to be here this morning with some of my staff that you're going to uh, hear from later. But just, just picking up on the point about it's the small things as well and, and the culture. Um, and at Wigan uh, Council, the whole council has embraced that trauma-informed approach. So... Our HR colleagues have had the training, et cetera. It's small steps um, because obviously, you know, enormous amount of, of issues and, and, and people. But I definitely think it's aided our development in the social work arena um, to have that sort of culture around us. So, yeah, just a real advocate of that, that wholesale approach, but also some of those small things make a big difference to really pushing forward uh, the approach. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes. The, the, uh, good morning. My name is Paul O'Callaghan from Families Need Fathers. First of all, thank you very much. It was a fantastic talk, very, very insightful. Um, I, I wonder if there are, we, broadly speaking, we see two types of people in trauma in family courts. One of them who have, are traumatised and end up in the family courts, and there is another significant percentage of people who, who are traumatised by the family courts. And I wonder if that second bucket, if I can call it a bucket, is um, because of the lack of predictability of the outcomes. As I know when a lot of people make their first application or turn up in family courts, it is a black abyss that they're jumping into and they don't know actually what the outcome is going to be. And the deeper and deeper they get into it, the more traumatised they are by the process. And I wonder if, there was, if we could narrow the corridor of outcomes somehow in the family courts, would that make it a less traumatic process to go through? Now, do you want to... Do you want to if I go over here, then... Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the difficulty is there's a kind of... Um, self-reinforcing process like you say once we're on high alert um, and we're really we're terrified of I mean people are terrified about what the outcome is going to be understandably that uncertainty I think puts people more on edge so I think anything that can be done I, I suppose it is probably difficult to preempt the outcome but anything that can be done to help people know when things are going to happen and when just one of the things I've I've worked with quite a lot of people involved in private law outside of you know my other practice and it's the, it's the uncertainty of, like, there's another hearing and then that gets pushed to another time and then that gets pushed to another time and it just feels like no one knows when it's going to end. So I certainly think having at least as much clarity as possible about the process would help. In terms of the different options of outcomes, that's, I don't think that's a question for me to answer because I'm not a, a legal professional. <laughs> no, no. Okay. But I've, I've, another parent support group, someone spoke recently and said... They got into working with supporting parents because that's what they thought they wanted to do, but they now realise they're running as something like a mental health charity because of the, the problems that are presented. And um, that brings her, but I can see you nodding as well. I'm sure that's the common experience. And, um, <laughs> there's a little pocket of people here. Karen was slightly early with her hand. Thank you, Sheena. I just wondered if you had any thoughts about how we protect young people from the trauma of proceedings where they are either uh, in, the subject in private or indeed in public proceedings? That's quite a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think there's a few things. I think, I think it's maybe slightly different in public and private law because in public law there's so many other things going on, like, you know, people potentially being in foster care and so on. 
And um, sometimes I think in public law, there's almost a bit more support for young people. They might have a social worker, they have someone that's really attending to their needs. I think in private law, there may be nobody who's really designated to attend to that young person's need. And in between hearings, they are still caught in the crossfire of, of what's going on. And I think that um, this goes back to my issue around us not recognising the impact of emotional harm and mental health, because a lot of these young people will not access mental health services unless they have enough money to pay for private mental health services. But then sometimes those private mental health services are might be caught in the and people don't want to take them on so I'm not sure it almost feels like they need their own designated service a service that really recognizes and gives them I mean where I've seen it really work is when children are given a genuinely neutral space to be able to um, just even meet somebody a play therapist a counselor somebody who is away from everything and allows them to step out of the dialectic between their parents and just talk about their own feelings. I think children in those situations, almost their feelings about the situation just get totally suppressed whilst they try and work out which parent they should be pleasing or how to kind of, yeah. So, and I think that the, I mean, I have a young person working with me who's now 21 and whose the proceedings went on from the age of 10 until she was about 17. So you know, and I'm still working with, you know, it, it, these are long, they're subtle, but long term impacts that young people are experiencing. So I think there's something about us making that visible and acknowledging it. And I always think, I mean, my starting point with people, whoever they are, is to a, ask them where they're at and how they are, but also to help them to acknowledge with them how difficult the situation is. I think because sometimes when we feel we can't do something about something, we sort of <laughs> kind of ignore it. <laughs> So I don't have a great solution for you there, Karen. <laughs> right. I'll come to people here. But Melanie, have you got anything from the, the online? Um, look, there, there are a couple of questions about um, personality disorder and the link between personality disorder and trauma. But also somebody has queried once a diagnosis of personality disorder has been made within the proceedings, how do you overturn that? And, there, and do you think there's a responsibility of of the, the court to be stringent about those psychological assessments and understanding what what the consequences are for a, a diagnosis of personality disorder and should it be trauma informed and I think oh, we know the answer to what you're say to that. Yes well there's a very interesting use of language there about this idea of a diagnosis being overturned as if it is somehow some kind of legally enshrined entity. I mean a diagnosis really is an opinion given by a clinical practitioner within the boundaries of their qualifications. Um, and so um, I've worked with many people who've said, can you write something down that's, you know, because there's something for, for some, we don't need diagnosis of depression or anxiety to be overturned, you know, and lots of people have multiple, get multiple, somehow personality disorder sticks and stays because of this issue about it being seen as some kind of fixed thing. Now, I would, you know, it is true that when we have those sorts of symptoms, they are, they take a lot longer to kind of maybe, uh, you know, change over time, but it doesn't mean that change can't happen. So I, I think we need to um, help people understand what diagnosis is, actually, and what the limits of it are. I often see the way it's talked about in court as if it's like hmm. a genuine entity. And the problem with like, Physical health diagnosis, this, that system is like you, 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 you look at symptoms like of diabetes, you diagnose diabetes, but you can also do a test that tells you that the pancreas isn't working. So you confirm your diagnosis. Whereas in psychiatry, we're looking at the symptoms. We don't really have any sort of tests that confirm what's happening. So diagnoses always remain a hypothesis, in my view, um, kind of best guess hypothesis about what's going on. And as I've said, diagnostic frameworks are changing all the time. I mean, there were loads of diagnoses that disappeared between the DSM-4 and the DSM-5. So we're talking about overturning diagnosis. What does that say about how permanent a diagnosis is? So, mm. yeah. yeah. I don't know if I've answered that question. but uh, And yes, I think it should be. And I think the whole issue about... I mean, I could go rabbit on that forever, but I think there's a kind of real issue about the relationship between psychiatric diagnosis and trauma, um, and that goes back along. You, you have to go back and look at the history of psychi psychiatry and the history of psychoanalysis to to understand that. But it is a, it's a very curious thing that trauma has somehow been outside. I mean, it took 40 years from when people first identified PTSD in soldiers coming back from war. It was 40 years before it got into the DSM as, as PTSD in 1980. There are lots of reasons why society doesn't want to acknowledge trauma-related diagnoses. 
And that's something that we need to understand. It doesn't seem to happen as much in other areas of science, but maybe yeah. it does. Yeah. There's time for a couple. Omar Farouk, yep. there's a microphone coming. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, the, I've, in, my, in my work, I'm a barrister, and I sometimes come across um, children who are autistic. And this relates to the question asked previously in terms of labeling. So there's been diagnosis, they are aware that that's their condition, but they don't like the use of that label. And if you had any, um, any insights into that. And the second question is, uh, are there any other, and forgive me, it might seem unfair, are there any other uh, legal systems or services internationally or you've come across who are doing this quite well which we could emulate in the UK. Thank you. Well, the, the, in response to the first question, I think this issue about someone being given a label, you have to step go back even further to the way in which mental health professionals interact with people. You know, in theory, we're meant to be helping people, people meant to come to us and we're, you know, and I think diagnosis should be at some level we need to have a collaborative pr process because if somebody doesn't like their diagnosis I'm not sure how useful it is for them but I you know for children with autism one of the one of the issues is for, I always ask when parents are saying should I get my child diagnosed I'll say well what why are you doing it what is the benefit for this young person because sometimes a diagnosis for a young person is really helpful because if everyone around the system sees their behavior and doesn't understand their behavior then they kind of get labeled as kind of naughty or bad or what have you and some and some people who've had a diagnosis of autism feel very pleased they feel relieved oh, thank goodness I understand myself this is great you know now I have a thing and I have a reason for it so I think but I think if a, if a child is very uncomfortable with the diagnosis I think someone has to sit down with them and explore why you know and and then if, the, if they don't want to identify themselves that way how would they like to identify themselves what do they and I would often say well what do you understand about what autism is what do you what how you know how do you what do you think is different or the same about yourself and quite often when you dig into it a lot of it is to do with a stigma maybe that they feel about that diagnosis and the way it might have been used around them there's a really um there's a, a beautiful bit there's a book called um differently wired written by a mother of a a, a child who, with a neurodiverse child and she describes this interaction between her husband and her and her autistic son and the husband is reading aloud a news article to her saying, oh, look, there's some research that says such and such reduces the risk of having an autistic child. And the son said, what do you mean risk? And when I read that, I thought, oh, my God. I mean, it really, really stayed with me. So the stigma we have is really, really implicit in the way that we operate. So, yeah, I think we've got to take a few steps back to understand that situation. The question about other legal frameworks, I don't know about legal establishments, but I do know there are some... There's some interesting papers and writing. I, I, I sort of made loose reference to them. I'm happy to share those references with anyone who's really interested. But there's some really interesting papers around trauma-informed lawyering and including trauma-informed thinking in training for lawyers. Um, good. I'm going to close this off now because we do need to keep to time. But the good news, everyone, is there's a panel session at the end um, where all the people who've taken part in the day will be on the platform, including... Gina, and this is a dynamic day, so keep the questions that you haven't yet asked, and they'll bubble up at some later stage. We've got a quarter of an hour now, um, and so uh, don't hover, get going on the coffee, <laughs> and we're coming back for the Family Justice Young People's Board at 11.15. Thank you. <laughs>